is we have to begin with what it means to be a living organism in ongoing interaction with its environments. A living organism requires a semi-permeable boundary within which the very conditions for life are maintained. Uh, here's the way the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio puts it. And this mirrors some of the, tracks some of the things that we've heard over the last two days. Life is carried on, carried out inside a boundary that defines a body. Life and the life urge exist inside a boundary, the selectively permeable wall that separates the internal environment from the external environment. If there is no boundary, there is no body. And if there is no body, there is no organism. Life needs a boundary. I believe that minds and consciousness, when they eventually appeared in evolution, were first and foremost about life and the life urge within a boundary. Energy in the form of nutrition must come into the organism and waste must be expelled. The preservation of life requires the maintenance of a finely tuned dynamic equilibrium within the organism boundary. The parameters of the homeostatic balance operate within a fairly narrow range. If you get too hot or too cold, you die. If your salt levels go too low, our brain activity shuts down. If we don't get enough oxygen, we're goners. Because the conditions for our survival demand it, our bodies and brains are exquisitely evolved to monitor our bodily states as they are affected by our continuous engagement with our environments. Damasio rightly identifies this preservation and recovery of homeostasis as the ur value of all living creatures. And by the way, he, homeostasis is not just returned to some set, that preset value. Damasio would include the notion of allostasis, even though he won't use the term for some reason. But allostasis is the, the, the uh, creation of, the, not just the return to a set point, um, like a thermostat, but allostasis is coming up with a new set point, so it's, it's, uh, there's novelty, but you come back into some sort of homeostatic balance. And Damasio's gonna say, this is the fundamental value for us. Everything else is, comes out of that. Here's how he says it. The physiological state of a living organism's tissues within an optimal homeostatic range is the deepest origin of biological value and valuations. My hypothesis is that objects and processes we confront in our daily lives acquire their assigned value by reference to this primitive of naturally selected organism value. The values that humans attribute to objects and activities would bear some relation, no matter how indirect or remote, to the two following conditions. First, the general maintenance of living tissue within the homeostatic range suitable to its current context. Second, the particular regulation required for the process to operate within the sector of the homeostatic range associated with well-being relative to the current context. So Damasio is going to say, whatever else we do, we've got to keep living. That's, that's, what, that's what life is about. And so you've got to have the maintenance of that homeostatic range that's suitable for survival. But then he goes on to say, but that's not the only value because we creatures like us want fulfilled lives, want meaningful lives. So he brings in the second dimension is well-being and flourishing. Um, and, and so his idea, which he, it's a hypothesis, could you explain all values that cultures have in terms of homeostasis? He thinks you can. Um, uh, we'll see about that. In short, unless you maintain this dynamic equilibrium of your internal milieu, Nothing else matters because nothing else by way of growth and flourishing of the organism is even possible. For the most part, this life-preserving and enhancing activity goes on automatically and unreflectively before you know it, beneath the level of our conscious awareness. However, in creatures like us, creatures with self-awareness, we sometimes have consciousness of these bodily homeostatic monitoring processes which is to say that we become aware of how we, our, our surround, um, surroundings meaningfully reveal themselves to us and change us. 
That is, we feel the qualities that make up our world, the redness of a ripe Bing cherry, the redness of your lover's lips, the redness of a bodily wound, the redness of an Oregon coast sunset, and the redness of a vermilion flycatcher. That's the stuff of life, qualities that we live for and die for. But we don't just feel individual qualities. So the, I want to stress the qualitative dimensions of meaning. We don't just live for individual qualities like the, the red of this red of the gala apple, this blue of the April sky, or this green of the prickly pear cactus. As John Dewey showed us, every quality we experience exists already within <clears throat> and gets its meaning from the environing situations within which we find ourselves. Each situation is a whole whose unity and identity are felt as a pervasive qualitative unity, <clears throat> what, we might call, um, what we might call our felt sense of our situation in the world. And I want to stress that. It's, this, is, this goes beneath propositions and concepts to our basic being at, way of being at home in the world and ha being in a Numveld. And, and Dewey has a name for this. He calls it sense. To say that a given situation makes sense is to say that we can grasp enough of its meaning for our lives such that we can be at, at least somewhat at home in that situation. And that's what ecology is about, eco, so the home. So here's how Dewey explained this sense of a situation. It is, quote, an immediate and imminent meaning. It is meaning which is itself felt or directly had. When we are baffled by perplexing conditions and finally hit upon a clue and everything falls into place, the whole thing suddenly, as we say, makes sense. In such a situation, the clue has signification in virtue of being an indication, a guide to interpretation, but the meaning of the whole situation as apprehended is sense. So, so far, I've, what I'm talking about today is how human beings make meaning and how it's tied to our bodies and life conditions. And so what I've said so far is we're qualitative creatures. Meaning is fundamentally qualitative. Secondly, I've said it's not just about individual qualities. It's about the entire quality that defines the sense of a situation you're in. And everything in life stems from that. Though we philosophy, philosophers have made a living of denying that, of putting all that down and putting everything up into the intellectual, the rational, what they call the rational, the pr propositional, uh, the conceptual. It's because entire situations can make sense, that is, can afford us meaningful experiences that we can function more or less successfully in our surroundings. There's a pervasive unifying quality that circumscribes and defines every meaningful situation within which we then focus on particular qualities objects, movements, changes, and patterns of causation. On those unsettling occasions when things cease to make sense, we feel ourselves to be aliens, not at home in the world we are in, in, in inhabiting. This is not a place to get into the details of the neuroscience of experience. However, there's considerable evidence that humans have evolved brain architectures, both in its core shell structure and in its bilaterality, that support Dewey's idea that we first encounter a whole situation through felt sense within which we then make various discriminations of objects, qualities, and relations. For example, there's a core, a, a core shell, the limbic core and then the cortical shell. There's a, a core shell um, architecture in which the limbic core first provides a holistic affect-rich um, sense of a situation, just like Dewey said, followed by various sensory and motor areas in the neocortical shell where we mark out more specific qualities, objects, and events. And my colleague Don Tucker is, is one of the world's specialists on, on this brain architecture, and I just want to read you quickly what he says about this. At the core, the limbic core, must be the most integrative concepts. Um, and you don't have to think just concepts, but it's a holistic integrative experience formed through the fusion of many elements through the dense web of interconnection. 
this fusion of highly processed sensory and motor information together with direct motivational influences from the hypothalamus, which is to say its values all the way down, there's no value-free anything, um, would, uh, would create a syncretic form of experience, your sense of being in a situation. Meaning is rich, deep, with elements fused in a holistic matrix, charged with a visceral significance. Emanating outward from this core neuropsychological lattice are the progressive articulations of the neocortical networks. And finally, at the shell, we find the most differentiated. So here's what, here's, Dewey's turned it around. You don't come into the world with um, fragmented sensations and put them together into objects and build up experiences. You come in, into whole situations within which you then articulate objects and their properties and qualities. Body-based meaning is not limited only to our perception of qualities and our sense of unified situation. We also experience, as William James so eloquently described, the ongoing flow of our thinking and doing activities. And he was just incredible in his description, his phenomenological power of description. For instance, we experience what child psychiatrist and developmental psychologist Daniel Stern called affect contours, the very patterns of our developing experience which uh, we describe with adjectives and adverbs like speeding up and slowing down, build up and release, crescendo and decrescendo. We describe this experiential patterning using adverbs like halting, fluttering, floating, flying, dragging, surging, swelling, struggling, etc. It's the patterning of our, our embodied, engaged being in the world. Our bodies then become the yardstick by which we measure the meaning and value of everything we experience, everything we think, everything we communicate, everything we do. The fact that we humans can stand erect within our gravitational field gives point and purpose to the verticality structures. And so in cultures around the world, you're going to find what Lakoff and I call the verticality schema, image schema. And they're going to have um, they're going to use things that are tied to the body. Cultures and languages all over the world do this. They use body parts and project them onto aspects of the world. Um, in in Mistec, if you want to say she's sitting up in the tree, a uh, branch of the tree, you'd say something like she located arm tree. <laughs> you know, we, we, we understand the world in terms of body part projections. And I... I I argued many, many years ago that our most primitive engagement with meaning structures is in terms of things like containment, verticality, um, source path goal, balance, because these are the fundamental ways in which these bodies, which is all we've got, are in engaging the affordances, the structures that are afforded us by our environment. And so they're the most pr primordially meaningful structures we have. Now, um, how do you get abstraction? Well, um, if what that guy said in the email is right, that what we did was shit, um, well, I don't know. Here's what our claim was, is that a, a huge amount of abstraction in, in for humans comes from appropriating this body-based meaning from our sensory, motor, affective, and interpersonal relations. And then we use that um, to understand uh, what we think of as abstract notions. So just an example of something that you find in languages all over the world, you ha there's an understanding as seeing metaphor, where you take vis a source domain of vision and you use the structure and the, the um, logicals, um, the inferential structures and patterns of that source domain of vision, and you project that onto processes of understanding. So you say, that was an illuminating idea. Could you shed a little more light on what you were saying about image schemas? You know, um, uh, um, so you, it, that, was, that was obscure, et cetera. So our abstract concepts and the reasoning we do with them are structured mostly by conceptual metaphors in which the appropriate sensory motor structure of a source domain, such as vision, uh, we use it to understand non-physical domains. And this is critical. This is one of the big points I want to make 
for today, and that is that meaning, meaning is not primarily or principally linguistic. But because before that is what? With a theory of meaning like I'm putting forth here, you could begin to talk about painting, architecture, music, theater, performance, um, spontaneous gesture, and ritual practice in, that in terms that make sense of meaning. Because most of what goes on there is not propositional meaning. And it's not tied intrinsically to language. <clears throat> and I want to say, if how are we going to talk about these domains of meaning you know, that get shunted aside in, in certain mainstream linguistic analyses if we don't have these resources? So it's important to realize that this um, meaningful experience I've described underlies and exceeds conceptual or propositional structure. So I'm not putting down language. It's one of the most amazing things that the species ever evolved. And it allows us to do things that we couldn't do without it. That's not the point. But it is predicated upon and draws on all of this embodied meaning I've been talking about. Now, um, what I want to say next is that everything I've been talking about so far is about aesthetics. One reason that aesthetic theory is still so impoverished today is that it has been too wedded to linguistic meaning and as the paradigm of all meaning. So but you, see, you see this terrible stuff. People will say, well, we want to understand meaning in music. And they say, well, what's, what has meaning? Well, words, sentences. So if music has meaning, there must be analogs in music to like sentences. And they'll say, well, there are musical questions and musical phrases and things like that. And then they proceed to give an analysis of something that captures almost nothing of what the music does for you and how it's meaningful to you. Because they have such an etiolated and thin account of what meaning could be. So for, following Dewey's lead, I'm arguing for an aesthetics of embodied life based on the recognition of the aesthetic dimensions of all the processes that give rise to meaning. And Dewey says that the, um, the aesthetic is not some special, um, narrow, domain of experience, but it lies at the heart of all experience. It's the exemplar, um, the fulfillment of what experience is. Now, let me say how I'm using the term meaning, which is critical. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatist, so I, what I'm saying, and I think this is backed up by neuroscience and, and some cognitive science, um, the meaning of an experience is what it affords us, to use Gibson's term, uh, by way of related experiences. So meaning is relational. And the meaning of something is the experiences it elicits and affords us, whether they be past, present, or future projections. That's the view I have, and it's relational. Even beneath and beyond conceptual and propositional structures, meaning becomes manifest through pervasive unifying qualities, particular qualities, affect contours, a felt sense that are the stuff and processes of human meaning making. And objects, he said, are just events with meaning. So we had a process metaphysics. All right, so I want to just now give you, I want to, uh, uh, before I turn to very brief comment on ethics, um, because of time consideration, um, I want to give you a couple of examples of how I think this meaning comes together, which are kind of fun. Um, here's what I'm doing. I'm arguing for the restoration of aesthetics to the center of any account of human experience and meaning making. During my days as a graduate student in philosophy in the 70s, I was taught that the real discipline of philosophical understanding, real men, is what we were back then, well, the real people did uh, epistemology, logic, and metaphysics. Ooh. And I was left with the value fields, 
boo, you know, that's th those who couldn't hack it would do the value fields. So I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get back at them by saying the stone that you cast out um, will become the foundation stone, the cornerstone of the new kingdom, and you guys are going to miss out on this. That's that's the basic idea. Now, fortunately, it's not the 70s. <laughs> um, Times they are changing in some sense. Cognitive science research coupled with pragmatist philosophy is revealing that aesthetics is the basis for everything since it explores the very emergence of meaning and value, not just in the arts, but in every aspect of our daily lives and in all of our so-called mental processes. Um, so I'm saying, uh, here, here's the basic idea. We've got to get over the idea that experience comes to us in terms of types, like there's, oh, there's religious experience, and there's ethical experience, and there's political experience, and there's aesthetic experience. No. You've got to see that when, when we validate the arts and when we praise the arts, they're operating with m these modes of meaning making, embodied meaning making I just uh, elaborated. Um, they're using those. But, but they are particularly intensified, harmonized manifestations of meaning, and that's why we care about the arts. They show us how we can be in the world, the possibilities for meaning. Um, so that's the basic idea, and, and so you want to see the, the aesthetic as pervasive and basic for a human being. The idea, it, it stems, um, a, a good friend of mine, Tom Alexander, wrote a book called The Human Eros, and he says, the human eros is our desire for meaning. We're meaning-making and meaning-seeking creatures. Yeah, we want to live, but as soon as we get that sort of taken care of, we're about meaning. All right. So um, we're still on time. A couple of things, and then I'll bail. Um, let, me, let me do the following. Why is it that we can be so profoundly moved by music, at least I am, um, moved to tears, exultant joy, wild abandon, melancholy reflection, and spontaneous dancing? The answer is not that music represents some pre-existent linguistic meaning that we grasp intellectually and that is then somehow represented in musical form. No. Music moves us directly by enacting the very processes of experience and meaning making that define our daily existence. It reaches down in our guts and pulls us out because we are mu musical creatures. We're rhythmic creatures. We're qualitative creatures. We have affect contours. Ooh, ooh, ooh. In spite of his Kantian formalism, even Edward Hanslick realized that music presents us with tonally moving forms that engage the affect contours of our everyday feelings. Over the rainbow carries us in arcs of longing and search um, to a different Oz-like world beyond our present circumstances. Somewhere over the rainbow and we're carried away. Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run also carries us along, but in a very different way, with a driving, urgent, feverish race toward we know not what or where. Tramps like us, baby, we were born to run. These are two very different ways our world can carry us forward. To give another illustration, um, what about architecture? which is um, meaningful to us at the most primitive level of our being. Given the typical size and makeup of our human bodies, certain enclosures afford us various types of containment experience. Some containers offer protection and coziness, while others feel confining and constraining. Some structured like, stru structures like Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin West root us within the rocky firmament on which we stand while carrying us in perception out into the horizon of desert light, dry air, and the distinctive sonoran sense. Other structures like Shark Cathedral project us toward a numinous, transcendent otherworldliness above and beyond our bodily situatedness in the world, while at the same time relying on that bodily constitution to give us the sense of mystery and sublimity in that upward directed space. So, I want to tie all this together now and have a little fun. Where are you? There you go. Um, 
And I want to play this little clip from Singing in the Rain. And this is my argument, this clip. Because what this is, is the most amazing enactment of human meaning. Some of it with words and language, but mostly through all these other embodied ways of uh, experiencing life. <laughs> Good night, Kathy. See you tomorrow. Good night, darling. Take care of that throat. You're a big singing star now, remember? This California dew is just a little heavier than usual tonight. Really? From where I stand, the sun is shining all over the place. which means that which was to be proven. <laughs> okay. Tap Pardon? You didn't show the tap dancing. No, I, there's only, and I'm actually out of time, and I, I was the <laughs> timekeeper this morning, so I have to, but I, I, I was supposed to talk about, a little about ethics, and so I have, I, I just want to end with a word about ethics. Um, I'm thinking here of morality and values. Once you focus on the values inherent in life maintenance and the values that contribute to enhanced meaning in our lives, you're brought to the conclusion that, so to speak, it's values all the way down. John Dewey argued that morality is in play whenever we are concerned with what is better or worse in experience, and I think that's right. It's a broad notion. Since we're never in value-neutral situation, moral considerations tend to be pervasive in our daily experience. This obviously puts moral considerations front and center in virtually everything we do. Of course, some situations are more morally charged than others, and we have to avoid moral fanaticism. Um, but we must never forget that we were always enmeshed in a morally significant world. And I think we saw that in, in all kinds of presentations over the last two days. We're always enmeshed in this morally significant world in which even our mundane and routine actions can have significant ethical implications. If the argument I've developed here is on the right track, then morality is fundamentally an aesthetic undertaking. Using the term aesthetic in the rich and broad sense I've been urging so far, moral appraisal and action comes out looking much more like a never-ending, continuous creation of an artwork than it looks like the following of unconditional rules. So he, let me just sum this up and stop. Dewey says, it, our problem isn't where our values come from. We've got as many good accounts of where values come from as you could, more than you can shake a stick at. So, the problem of morality, they arise when our values come into conflict. And then what are we going to do? And we can't just use the same rules and habits that have carried us this far because they're the ones that have not, are not adequate for the present situation. What Dewey's saying is we've got to, we don't live in a fixed moral universe. 
new things emerge. And so the strategies we had, the habits we had for dealing with our problems in life, those strategies run afoul of the change situations. And so his answer was, what we need is a process of what he called dramatic rehearsal, where we, in imagination, follow out various possible courses of action. And we actually have to get a sense of what in, um, re re reduces conflict, enhances meaning, liberates possibilities, et cetera. And so um, basically, what Dewey's arguing for is he's saying that this process is very much like the creation of a work of art, and it, it gives new meaning to the phrase, the art of living. Thank you. As Mark stated, uh, and I think uh, very aptly, uh, new things emerge. Uh, and myself as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oregon, uh, my research examines uh, biocommunication, biomedia, and bioart. And that is why it is such an honor to introduce Mark Bedeau, professor of philosophy and humanities at at Reed College and is supporting faculty at the Portland System Science Program at Portland State University. Professor Bedeau's current research interests include dynamical emergent processes, measuring and visualizing evolutionary dynamics, evolutionary design of chemical systems, and the creativity of cultural and technological evolution, along with the science of social and ethical implications of recreating and creating life. He is co-author of The Nature of Life, Classical and Contemporary Perspectives from Philosophy of Science, as well as The Ethics of Protocells, and most notably, co-author with Dr. Frichoff Capra's co-author, Pierre Luigi Luisi, of Philosophical and Scientific Perspectives on Emergence. Bodo is a co-founder of the European Center for Living Technologies in Venice, and his talk is entitled, The Mystery and Majesty of Life's Burgeoning Creativity. Please help me in welcoming him. Thank you, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today with you to talk for a little while about the question that is the topic of this meeting. It's been a, been a fascinating meeting. I think you'll see some connections between what I'm gonna say today with what Mark Johnson was saying just earlier and also to the very first talk that uh, Fritzelf Kopper gave us on Thursday afternoon. Um, what's striking about this question is what is life is usually taken to refer to biological life, but the subtitle, Lifestyles, Life Worlds, Life Works, makes it clear that the conference organizers had a broader view of life in mind. And thinking about the events at the workshop, you can see that the, uh, the workshop has, has grown into that space. And part of what I want to do is to provide one kind of justification for that, for starting with biology and ending up with this larger uh, realm. But I want to start with biology again. And the point of this slide is just to remind us all that life is remarkably diverse. You can see uh, very simple one-celled forms of life. Uh, and you can see incredibly, incredibly large uh, multicellular forms of life. And they're all very different. And this is, of course, just a tiny fraction of all of the forms of life that are on the Earth that we know about. So this is one of the striking ground floor facts about life. It's remarkable diversity. Another thing that is a striking ground floor fact about, fact about life is, sorry, as I hit that, uh, advance the slides incorrectly, is the complexity of the diverse forms of life that have evolved. This is a, a tree showing the different forms of life uh, that have spun off through the history of life. And you can see the eukaryotes down in the, in the lower right 
human beings are way off on the corner here and all of the eukaryotes, which is everything that most of the stuff that we're familiar with, most of the rest of it is, is uh, very, very primitive forms of life. And if you just blow up the part that we're most familiar with and, and tend to concentrate on the eukaryotes, you can see even there there's, an, again, an incredible diversity, but also some extremely complex forms of life. And of course, human beings are one of those, one of those things. So part of what's amazing about life is not just the diversity of forms that have been produced, but also the fact that from very simple beginnings, incredibly complicated forms of life have emerged. And that's part of what I think one would like to understand. So it's partly the striking diversity of life and the complexity of its forms that prompts the first question, the question in the title of the conference, what is life? And I want to talk for a minute about this question, sort of thinking about it the way a philosopher might think about it. And it seems like what we're asking about is what the nature of life is. We want to understand what's going on inside life. And a way to think about that is to have some explanation for how all the different things that are alive, what properties they share and are absent from all the different kinds of things that are not alive. And we're not interested in merely the things that happen to be alive around us, but also the things that might have been alive but aren't actually alive. So we're concerned with possible forms of life. So that's typically the way you might first start thinking about this question, what it means. And um, I, in this context, it's useful to look at a list of hallmarks that people have proposed over the years that are used to characterize life. I've picked one such list from Tibor Ganti, and this is an example of the sorts of things that people have often put together when trying to think of what life is. It's very hard to define, as will turn out, uh, as I'll stress, but it's very easy to list the distinctive features of living forms. And here is uh, a good list that Tibor Ganti put together. Various other people have put together lists. The lists are usually a little different, but there's a lot of overlap. And so there's a, there's a fair amount of agreement about these hallmarks. And it includes many things we've heard about before at this conference, such as emergent properties, metabolism, internal information regulation, stability, homeostasis, growth and reproduction, and uh, evolution. And so there's good news and there's bad news about this first question. First, the good news is that we do tend to agree about those hallmarks, r roughly. People who think about this come up with more or less the same lists. And the same thing is true for a list of borderline cases. We all more or less agree about which examples constitute borderline cases, like, for example, viruses. We're not sure. Different people might have different ideas about what to do with the borderline case, but we agree they are, on, they are borderline cases. And furthermore, there are various puzzles about life that arise as you think about it, such as the distinction between life and non-life, the way I was just describing it, I was describing it as a dichotomy. You know, something is alive or it's not capable of being alive. You know, the kind of thing that could be alive or couldn't. But actually, when you think more about it, um, it seems that maybe there's a, a scale, a matter of degree. There isn't a sharp distinction between the things that are alive and not, but rather there's something like a matter of degree. So anyway, this is one of the puzzles that arises about life, and there are a series of others. People typically agree about which things are puzzling, although we don't agree about how to solve the puzzles. So that's the good news. The bad news is that there isn't any agreement about how to go from this rough consensus about the hallmarks and the puzzles and borderline cases to an actual answer to the question. If you look at the uh, attempts to define uh, life or under, you know, answer that first question. Um, it's remarkable how diverse they are. Um, many of them are very interesting. They seem to be tapping into different intuitions. And the other thing that's striking is almost any definition that's been proposed very quickly is uh, met with a series of counterexamples. So the upshot of this is that the community of people who are trying to think about what life is trying to answer this question, the scientists who are doing this, the philosophers are doing this, there's a general sense of, a bit of a sense of malaise because it's so hard to make any progress. In fact, the more we work on trying to answer this question, the more diverse the answers become. It's not as if we're approaching some consensus. We seem to be bifurcating 
rather, uh, and the answers are splitting. So this has led a number of people to be skeptical about the question. They think the question is somehow misformed or inappropriate to ask, it's impossible to ask, it's pointless to ask, it's incoherent, it deserves deconstruction and debunking. That's a very natural reaction to the predicament to the bad news about question one. But it's also the case that this bad news about question one prompts especially a philosopher to ask a second question, what I call the meta question about life. And that's the question, how should we understand or take that question? What is that question actually asking? What would count as an answer to that question? So this is what I mean by the meta question. And my talk today is going to be about the, qu the question, question one about life, and the meta question about life and how to uh, negotiate these. In particular, how to answer them. So let's consider some of the typical answers that people would give to question two. Often these answers are presupposed rather than stated. Often people go ahead and try to give answers or debate answers to this question without really thinking consciously about the meta question, but the way they're talking about this question implies how they, what they think the answer to that question is. And for example, if you think about that question, what is life, one of the things that, the first things that comes to many people's mind about what that question means is that we're asking about the meaning of the word life. So that's a very natural response. Many people have that response. But I think if you think about it for a couple of minutes, you can tell that can't be what question one is asking because it's not an interesting question. This question is not a very interesting question. And why is that? Well, if you don't know the meaning of the word, what do you do? What would you do? You'd look it up in a dictionary. Has any of you ever had to look up the word life in the dictionary? No. The people who are debating the answer to that question, they don't have to look up the word in the dictionary. There's nothing in the dictionary that's going to help them answer that question. So this is a question that's a perfectly good question. It's just not the one that's motivating people who are interested in question one. So I just think it's a, you know, it's a, just a little slip, so we should just move on. A better answer, a more, uh, the typical next answer is that, well, of course, it's not the word life that we're interested in because First of all, it's just an accident. It's hap this discussion is happening in English. It could happen in some other language with a different word. We're not focused on the words. We want to understand the concepts that are shared by different languages. So maybe that's the answer. We want to understand the concept of life. So I think most people probably give an answer like this. If they think about what question two is, they'll say, oh, I think what question one is asking is something like, especially philosophers, something like, the con trying to understand the concept of life. So how do we like that answer? Well, I'm not too happy with it because of this, con this, idea, this phrase, the concept of life. What is the concept of life? You know, the way people think about life has changed over time, and even right now at different places in the world, people are thinking about, in different cultures, thinking about life in different ways. They have different concepts. So I think what this question is really asking about is our concept of life. What is our concept of life? That's a perfectly good question you can ask. Um, it's got some answer. Uh, you know, I think of anthropologists and people, like social scientists being interested in things like that. But it's not the question, it's not what this question is asking, I think. It's not what the people who are asking that question are interested in, in that are asking about, I don't, I don't think, because our concept is a historical accident. You know, it has a history, it came from somewhere, it's going somewhere else, and what I think people who ask that question are interested in is what life really is, not what we think about life. The question about the concept of life will, if you have the answer to that, our concept of life, it'll tell you how we think about life. But what I think many people who are asking that question, certainly me, are interested in is not first and foremost how we think about life. I want to think about life the way it actually is. I want my thinking to correspond to reality. So I want to know what life really is, the stuff out there. And the concept of life is in here. You see, so I think our concept of life is too inward directed. People, some people say, well, we're not interested in analysis of concepts. We are much more interested in paradigm cases of those concepts. 
But again, the same point arises, paradigm cases of which concept? Our contingent one that we have with our limited and imperfect understanding of reality and including life? You know, we can find such paradigm cases, but it's not clear that they're going to answer, tell you what life really is, unless your concepts correspond to reality. Um, people often talk about as if this question is if we're searching for definitions of life, which are you know necessary and sufficient conditions. And the main problem here is that every time people propose them, they uh, it's e it's easy to generate counterexamples. So I want to suggest a different answer to question two. This is the way I interpret the question. This is the way I think the question becomes an interesting question, a question that's important to try to answer, a question that deserves all of our time and, and energy. And it's basically to treat the question as an empirical, more or less scientific question, even though philosophers get to talk about it too and try to help answer it, akin to questions like what is heat or lightning or evolution or what are genes? You know, these things that we encounter or emotions, you know, something more subtle, things that are part of reality and we want to understand what actually are they like? You know, what do they amount to? So if we treat it as an empirical scientific question, what does that mean concretely? Well, think about a, an empirical science of some subject X, you know, you pick the, the topic. What I have in mind by empirical science here is nothing heavily uh, laden. It's rather just the idea that an empirical science, as I understand it, is trying to ex about X is trying to explain the key phenomena involving F X. You know, uh, if it's about heat, you want to explain the key phenomena involving heat, the things that we observe, and hence it's an empirical investigation. Same thing for lightning. Same thing for elevation evolution, same thing for genes, and I suggest the same thing for life. So in other words, my suggestion is, my answer to question two is that question one asks, what is the underlying explanation of life's key phenomena, just like this standard pattern for other empirical sciences? So what are life's key phenomena? Well, what I take that to be is, oops, is things like those hallmarks that I mentioned earlier. That's why I wanted to show them to you on a slide. Tibor Ganti's hallmarks of living systems, the commonly accepted properties that are the striking properties like metabolism and self-organization and um, the ability to evolve, which are found together in the universe in these things that we call alive. And so, in other words, my interpretation of this question, my answer to question two, is that that question is asking what's the key underlying explanation of the hallmarks of life? Why life has those hallmarks and not some other list? Why are those the, the hallmarks on the list rather than some other hallmarks? Why, why, what would be wrong about taking those off? Why are these, why is a virus a borderline case and not, uh, you know, a goldfish? Why are there puzzles about life being a dichotomy or a matter of degree? And my suggestion is that if you can explain all those things, you understand what life is. You understand why it's producing these hallmarks. The hallmarks are like the shadows in a cast in Plato's cave. Um, and we want to understand what's behind those shadows. So this sounds very abstract. It's very abstract for this late in the day in a, in a long conference. So let me try to make it a little, well, the last thing I want to do is make my suggest, my answer to question two clear by giving you an example of what an answer to question one would be if this is the right way to take that question. Okay? Is that too complicated? I'm going to, I think this is how we should understand that question. Here's a way to make that more concrete. I'll give you an example of how to answer question one if you take it that way. So I'm going to give you my answer to question one. I'll tell you what I think life is. But I have a couple caveats because it's late in the day. So first of all, I'm, this is a provisional answer. Um, I'm using this to illustrate how to answer question two or what my answer to question two is. Don't hold me on all the details of this. I'm going to say something which is slightly 
Well, in analytical philosophy, it would be considered very provocative and, and you know, uh, inappropriate, but I think this is a much more friendly crowd, so I can, I can do this, I think. Um, so what's my, my answer? I think that I'm going to suggest that life, what the phenomena out there really is, the explanation behind all this stuff, it's the process of burgeoning creative evolution. So I have to explain a bit about what that means. But the reason, I'm, the way I'm going to justify this is that I think the process of burgeoning creative evolution best explains life's hallmarks and also the borderline cases and also the puzzles. So the idea is if I could do that, that would be how I think we can figure out what life really is, what's explaining all this phenomena involving life. So let me remind you of what those hallmarks are. These are Ganty's hallmarks again. I want to explain why living systems have emergent properties, why they have metabolism, which has been discussed many times, why they have internal information control, and why they're homeostatic or allostatic. They're, you know, stable against environmental changes, why they grow and reproduce, why they inherit information and evolve. And in the interest of time, I won't go through each of these in detail, but the way I, the, my answer to question two says, if you really want me to answer question one, I've got to go through each one of those and tell you how, if there's a process of burgeoning creative evolution, this is the sort of properties you'd expect the, the products to have. So let me just say um, a little bit more about what I mean by burgeoning creative evolution and a little bit about how I could explain some of those yellow uh, concepts. I won't go through all of them, but first of all, burgeoning creative evolution. So creative evolution, burgeoning creative evolution is emphasizing an evolutionary process which is producing qualitatively new things continually. And um, new kinds of, it's not just we have new forms of life like more kinds of bacteria and then more and more and more and more. It's rather we have things that aren't bacteria anymore, qualitatively new kinds of things. From single-celled organisms, we get multi-celled organisms and eventually on that, remember that chart I showed you in the very beginning, you have things like us coming out of the same kind of process. So that's the kind of thing that I mean by a creative evolutionary process. And burgeoning just is to convey that it keeps on going. It's a sort of inherent fount of, of uh, it, new kinds of information. I say that's a certain kind of process, a certain kind of evolutionary process. It seems to go on in biology. And I'm saying that process is what we should really identify as the key thing in life because it explains those other things like uh, metabolism. Let's pick that because we've talked about that. A number of people have talked about that before. Why is metabolism on the lift if there's burgeoning creative evolution is the key thing? Well, if you have a process of burgeoning creative evolution, you've got to have these things that are being produced, you know, the, the organisms, the population of entities, and they have to survive in the face of the laws of physics, including the second law of thermodynamics, which is causing everything to degrade over time. And one of the amazing things about life, which is emphasized by this concept of metabolism, and this is what Schrodinger was talking about in his famous book, What is Life, is that the process of metabolism is what enables that to happen. That's how you can have a complex structured entity that persists through time. And you need to have that if you're going to have things which are you know, have a burgeoning creative evolutionary process. So the idea is that unless you've got metabolism in the entities that are in the population, this process is never going to get going. So metabolism, in that way, you can explain why it's on the list. It's there to enable, you need it to have this process of burgeoning creativity to work. So in a similar way, you can imagine how I could explain, uh, how you might explain all these other concepts. So, but let me just move on and and try to wrap things up with a couple more slides. First of all, many of you are probably, if this, if this were at an analytical philosophy meeting, everyone would be writing down their counterexamples, and many of them are going to take the following form. People are going to say, look, there are lots of things that are not alive, but exhibit that kind of creative evolution, evolutionary process that I was just describing. And their examples are things like the global economy, culture in general, technology, media, lots of other things that are of deep interest to the people in this room and in this conference. To most philosophers, they would say this is a counterexample. Your theory is wrong. 
But because of how I answered, well, if the way I had answered question two was saying I'm analyzing our concept of life, this might be a serious counterexample. Because our concept of life does not apply to things like the global economy, typically. However, remember, my answer was that it's an empirical scientific question. And so I can treat this as a feature rather than a bug. I can say that we've learned something about what life is that's surprising. In other words, if the process of burgeoning creative evolution really is the best explanation for why all these hallmarks appear and why the puzzles arise and why there are borderline cases, then, um, and, and that's what we should identify as the root to what life is, what life really is, then we look around the world and we would discover there are other things that deserve to be called alive because they exhibit that same kind of process. In other words, the empirical scientific, if the empirical scientific picture was that lumping together life, what we, biological life, with things like technology and media made the simplest explanation of the features of life, then it would be appropriate to say the global economy really is alive. Same for the evolution of technology, et cetera. So that's what I mean by you can turn, because of how I answered question two, you can turn these counterexamples into surprising discoveries rather than flaws. Okay, so just to wrap things up, the, the picture that's emerging from what I've been saying here is that life itself, this process of burgeoning creative evolution, if you buy this provisional hypothesis, which I was using mainly to illustrate how question two is taken, but it's also an answer that I find plausible, kind of in line with, with what uh, Fritjof Kopper was saying too. Then this process is, uh, you know, in populations of organisms and the colonies that they form and other larger groups, but also human societies and human culture, human technology, human media, etc. And so I want to just end by justifying the title of my talk, which was The Mystery and the Magistry of life's creative evolution. So I think you can see why I'm talking about life's creative evolution. I'm trying to suggest that that's a way to think about what life really is. Uh, and what about the mystery and the magistry? Well, a number of you must have stood on the rim of the Grand Canyon at some point in your life. A number of people in this room, I'm sure, have. And there's this something that's kind of awe-inspiring by being there, it's, uh, I mean, it's almost, you feel it in your body in line with the, the early, what Mark Johnson was talking about. And, um, you know, most of us have a, uh, it's very commonly to come and to, uh, be very struck by the majesty of, of the scene. And there's a very similar sentiment that Charles Darwin expresses at the very end of the, uh, the Origin of Species. Here's the, the very last paragraph of the book. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to just point out a couple things, uh, which you can see near the end. In fact, if you look sort of uh, start about there, I want to just call your attention to, he earlier is describing the process of natural selection. That's what the whole book's been about. And then he says, there's a grandeur in this view of life. And he goes on to say, this is in part because from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And it's his use of terms like grandeur and beautiful and wonderful that are something that I feel uh, not only looking at the Grand Canyon, maybe some of you too, but also thinking about the diversity of life and this incredible complexity of, of it, and also thinking about this process itself, the process of burgeoning creative evolution. That to me is also just a wondrous thing, just like the, as much as the the Grand Canyon or the photographs that are in the display out here. And so it's in that sense that I think life's burgeoning creativity really is both mysterious and majestic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to invite um, both, uh, both Marks uh, up to uh, the podium here, uh, along with uh, Professor Capra and Professor Monani as well uh, for the, our discussion session.
And we're going to keep the discussion sessions uh, very short, but uh, just want to say thank you so much for everyone's participation and everyone's patience t today. Um, and so in, in noting uh, today's uh, events and uh, this entire weekend, uh, first off, I just want to say how grateful we are for everyone's participation. And I think to just begin, we're going to uh, have uh, Salma and uh, Fritjof offer some, uh, uh, some brief comments on the presentations uh, as such, and also some brief comments as well on the conference itself and the themes that have been uh, pre uh, begun. Uh, would either of you like to go first? Please, Salma, take it away. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, um, both of you, for giving me a very thoughtful and engaging um, uh, closing plenary over here. Um, I've had a lot of fun at the conference, and I have to say, I feel a little bit like an imposter up here. Um, Jeremy asked me during the conference if I wanted to do this, so this was not <laughs> premeditated, and I feel like I'm not a philosopher like the others who are up here. Um, I'm also not an old white man. <laughs> So I, I don't know what, what I have to be up here, but I, uh, I'll try. I'll try and, to respond. And in fact, uh, it's, it's your background in eco-critical theory in relationship to these thoughts, just so you know. Yes. Um, and, and Jeremy, when he approached me, he said to talk about eco-critical theory. So I, I will try to talk about that. But um, I, I also have a background in geology, so I love that Mark ended with the Grand Canyon, because one of the thoughts that I had as I was listening to you um, uh, talk, Mark, was if we're thinking about this idea of burgeoning um, creative processes, the timescales in which we look at these. And so if we think of the Earth and geological timescales, what does that potentially mean uh, for a, a life form as and, and we certainly have the Gaia hypothesis is one way to think about it. Um, but that geology background certainly comes up. And this gets me to the three points that I actually do want to say that I think tied to both your um, talks really well, but also to the conference in general. Uh, what I really have enjoyed in these last few days with my own interdisciplinary background in geology as well as communication studies and, and that eco-criticism is the interdisciplinarity of this conference, that it is so uh, wonderfully interdisciplinary. And certainly since the time I started doing my work, um, these connections, these conversations across disciplines have become so much more um, vocal, so much more present, so much more relevant. Um, so the fact that we have the sciences, trying to think about the sciences here, but also to think about aesthetics and philosophy and, and meaning making and culture. Um, and e e well, it's fun for me certainly as an eco-criticism, we're doing the same things, the idea of storytelling. So, I mean, um, Paul Slovic and Scott Slovic, who many of you are probably familiar with, um, there's, there's a cognitive scientist working with a humanist and sort of thinking of how do we make meaning, the, the whole idea of numbers and nerves coming together. Um, so that, I also wanted, since I am talking about eco-criticism, um, there are a couple of people who I want to give a shout out to who have been influenced by some of this work. Uh, Alexa uh, Weick von Mosner has a wonderful book that looks at these sort of ideas of meaning making um, within narrative, which is what eco-criticism is all about, the narrative, the storytelling. Um, called Affective Ecologies, where she draws on neuroscience to try to understand what is it about stories when we watch or hear or listen, why is it that we are affected? So Mark's presentation of singing in the rain, um, what is it that makes us, even though it is in our immediate, it, it's a virtual it's a virtual world. What is it that sort of gets us to think? And as a consequence, uh, because my background is in ego criticism, of course, it's environmental. So this notion of what is it about caring about others, because that is in some ways the at the crux of our environmental dilemmas. How do we care about the rest of the world and our relationships with the world? Um, so I wanted to uh, mention her. I also want to mention Erin James, who has a wonderful book that's now um, just been nominated by the Association for S the Society for Literature and Environment called The Story World Account, which does a similar thing, sort of drawing on this neuroscience cognitive background. Um, 
So that's my little um, conversation about eco-criticism. I want to say two more things, um, and those have to do with indigenous studies and then film studies, because I think they're very pertinent to what you're saying here. So this idea of life and how we conceptualize life, um, Mark, is certainly something that we have thought, that indigenous cultures have thought of in the way that you're sort of headed towards. This idea that everything, it is not just how we conceptualize you, me, or the living, um, but the rocks, et cetera. Um, what I want to say, though, over there, and what is fascinates, well, I wouldn't say fascinates, but certainly drives my, my work with indigenous studies is that even though we have these cosmological ideas, that the sort of hegemonic duality of the Western world makes it very hard to keep these relationships in place. And so you have a lot of indigenous people who are just like us in a world where we're constantly made to separate, to have these dualities, to sort of think of life as separate from the non-life, to think of things as things as opposed to agential living potentialities. Right? So within that context, one of the things that indigenous communities are doing because they know their own people have been dislocated from these sort of cultures and these environments is to try to recreate those connections. And they're doing that through film, which is directly related to my interest in sort of the eco-critical aspects of film. And so that takes me to my third point, which is to think about film studies. And film studies has been thinking about affect for a really long time, since the 1980s. You have Noel Carroll. You have the notion of how is it that films get us to feel. When we think about films, we think about movement and feeling. So one of the thoughts I had as we're thinking of life in all these different ways is what, what do we do with creating environments, virtual environments? And this sort of speaks to the whole conference as well because we've seen so many talks about the ideas of digitality, of media. This is a conference about media. And one of the things that sort of worries or or I wouldn't say worries, but certainly occupies and preoccupies film scholars is how does affect, how can you have that immediate affect that you have through the storytelling last beyond the few moments when you're in there? Right? What, how long lasting can that affect be? And so that's sort of a, a way to end because I, I know we've got, we want to have time for other people, but this idea of how we can have virtual environments um, have long term, or, or I guess to think scale. So I started with scale, and I'm going to end with this notion of scale. Oh, th thank you. Uh, Professor Capra. Well, I, I would like to continue with what Salma said about the interdisciplinarity. I was also very impressed by the strong interdisciplinarity, and in particular by the fact that. Uh, a conference organized by social scientists and philosophers included significant discussions of the material world. Now, this is very rare because, as you know, in, a, in the academic world, we have organized things in such a way that the natural scientists take care of the material world and uh, material structures and the social scientists of social structures. But it's very important to overcome this division because the great challenge of our time for uh, social scientists, natural scientists, and everyone else is to create and nurture sustainable communities. That is, uh, communities whose technologies and social institutions, in other words, whose material and social structures do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. And to do so, uh, the design principles of our future social institutions must be consistent with the principles of organization that nature has evolved to sustain the web of life. And therefore, a unified conceptual framework for the understanding of material and social structures 
is absolutely necessary. So I was delighted to hear a lot about ecology, about microbiology, about embodiment, about the characteristics of biological life, and in the workshops many other things like water management, architecture, and, and lots of other things. So I, I would just congratulate the organizers and, and all of you for putting this on because uh, it's not only intellectually stimulating, but uh, you know, if, if you want to be extreme, it's essential for the survival of humanity. Thank you, Professor Kaffer. Uh, um, uh, um, this is going to uh, both Marks. Uh, do you have any comments on, uh, on either of your presentations? <coughs> or on your own as well? Um, I have a couple comments. Yeah, please. A couple comments on the comments. Yes, <laughs> please comment on the comments. So just say one, comments. one about each comment. Um, I, I was fascinated by your comments as uh, some indigenous cultures think about life in the way in which it's, you know, as a creative, unending process because, because uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting, first of all, that they, however they think about it, it would be interesting to know. But if I'm right or something like what I was saying is right, then it seems like they're actually closer to the truth mm -hmm. and all the more important for uh, trying to study what they're saying and understand it and you know, not, not just just take it, give it the, the attention it deserves. But I wanted to say just briefly something about sustainability too. Um, from the point of view of this picture of life's burgeoning creativity, the thing that <coughs> strikes you if you take seriously this idea about life inherently being a creative process is that um, however life is now, it's not going to be the same tomorrow. It's changing constantly. And so sustainability is trickier, more interesting, but also more difficult if it's con if you know that the solution to sustainability is not sticking where you are now, because that's just not going to happen. It just That's not how life works. And so it is po you need a more systemic, a more process-oriented, sort of a creative, flexible, continually learning process to create, uh, to achieve genuine sustainability, I think. And, and if, I, if I may, um, uh, is there, a, could you've elaborated on this burgeoning creativity, creative evolution, but an overlapping theme in your work and Dr. Capra's author, Pierre Luigi Luisi, can you elaborate on, on how uh, you approach and, uh, and Luisi's work uh, in Capra's book also elaborate on synthetic biology and protocells in this regard? Um, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, I'll, just do, I'll just say something in, in yeah. one minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am very interested in protocells and efforts uh, in synthetic biology to take existing forms of life and modify them in various ways and also to create life in the laboratory like what Luisi is trying to do, create life in the laboratory from things that are not alive, from non-living materials he buys from a chemical supply house. And I'm, I'm very interested in both those things because I think they're in part extremely important for trying to understand whether what I was saying today is right. Because if, you know, it's one thing to, it may sound like a nice story, but so far it's a bunch of words and the way to test it is like what Luisi was doing. He was inspired by a different idea, it was autopoiesis, which is roughly like metabolism on my list, but he was not so centrally uh, concerned with evolution. He was focusing on autopoiesis and he had various ideas and Varela had various uh, uh, hypotheses and until you actually try to do what he did, it's very hard to tell whether it's just a bunch of words or whether it actually works. And so in other words, this research is crucial for giving you more uh, empirical information that's not going to be available otherwise to try to answer these very hard questions. By the way, one of the things that is an offshoot of this is that um, these questions include not just aesthetic questions but also moral questions and social questions because making new forms of life or modifying existing forms of life, especially if it continues to evolve in a creative way, you know, we have to be really careful about this and think about it and make sure it's making sense and uh, and so I think it's crucial for the scientists and the philosophers to have a deep sense of social responsibility about what they're doing to think about it upstream, mm -hmm. like in places like this. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, 
it's, it's fascinating how these concepts all hang together. And the way Luisi usually presents the same material is that he says uh, a cell is autopoietic, which means that it constantly creates and recreates itself. Whenever something dissipates or, or gets injured, it constantly mm -hmm. renews itself. In order to do that, these processes need a lot of energy and need food, material, which comes into the cell. So you need a constant stream of energy and matter to sustain an autopoietic system. And that's what metabolism is. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. when it turns out, when you study this flow of energy and matter in detail, as Prigogine has done, you, you hit upon the phenomenon of, of emergence. So it all hangs together. And I would love to stay here with you another hour and, <laughs> and, and pick apart what you said yeah. and said, no, I'm starting with metabolism mm -hmm. and I'm deriving everything you said from metabolism. Mm -hmm. And you do the opposite and both are true. And uh, I come away with the, with the feeling that we, we don't have a linear sort of analytical presentation and definition of life, but we have more of a gut feeling, and you will like this because it's embodied <laughs> intuition of what life is. Uh, but, but can I uh, oh, sort of respond that? to that? Oh, go oh, ahead, Mark, if you had something to say. Mark, oh, please. Well, I have two old white guys' thoughts. <laughs> um, one to, to each of these two. First, uh, Mark, and this meshes with what both of you were saying, I think there's a more fundamental indeterminacy in these kinds of definitional projects. Um, and that you stop short of. And that is the last, uh, the, one, the bottom line for you was you have to pick out key phenomena. But I just point out that uh, the world does not come with key phenomena tattooed on it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean objects. You, it, that's a value decision. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's an inescapable value indeterminacy mm -hmm. in, in, in any mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. you look at. And I, I saw this when I worked on attention 10 mm -hmm. years ago and the metaphors for attention. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's so naively, I thought, well, scientists, they know what the phenomena are and then they create theories to explain them. But no, they don't agree about what the phenomena are, the key phenomena. What's imp and, and Whitehead said one of the fundamental values of science is importance. You have to decide what's important. Mm -hmm. So what you were responding to, I thought very nicely was there are native traditions that would say, um, you know, the wind is alive. And so, so they, what they're identifying as the key phenomena um, are very different from our Western um, murdering ways. <laughs> the, the, the second thing I wanted to say something about is, and it was with respect to the virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, we, we're starting to get a really good idea about how pow why they're so powerful. And, I don't, you don't have to jump on the crazed uh, mirror neuron bandwagon to, to believe this, but there, there's quite a bit of evidence that there's a mirror neuron system and there's what are called canonical neurons. And when you see these things enacted mm -hmm. on the screen mm -hmm. or when you read about them, the areas of your brain um, having to do with the things you're reading about are actually weakly activated in you. And you, and this is the way in which you really are in there, in and through it. And so the the pain when 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 she leaves him, you know, and you read that and you get choked up. That's a real emotion. That's not a virtual emotion. That's a real emotion tied to an engagement with an, a meaningful affordance. And it, it works via, I think it works primarily via the mirror neuron system. I, I totally agree with you. And I've and certainly and seen that research you know, as well. Punch, zips, but uh, I think af effective cognitive science gives some But I think the, the question that I think film uh, study scholars are struggling with now is the time scale question. In the moment you have that experience, in the moment you have that feeling. So certainly with environmental film, one of the things that we struggle with is like, you watch, for example, you watch a film that is about animal rights and you see these horrible things happening on screen. And then you say, you know, in the moment you say, I'm never gonna eat a burger again. And you walk out and two days later, you're eating that burger. So that time effect, how long those affects last within the virtual world is something that we struggle with. And I don't know if this, this data is yet. You know, but that. my girlfriend in high school, when she broke up with me, we'd been together for 18 months. That's a, lo that's a long enough time. 
So I only saw that film for, um, you know, how many ever minutes that, that ran. I mean, I have a whole invested being in the world with my <laughs> high school girlfriend, and when she dumped me, you know, well, of course, it still bothers me today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Why and wasn't I good enough? <laughs> and, and I think this is the important thing, that we have to think of the real world interacting with that virtual world because you have that experience of your girlfriend in the real world, that movie holds a lot more meaning for you. And, and that is the sort of thing that I think film scholars are struggling with. But I, I also think it goes back to the time scale over here where in some ways I think what you're perhaps debating in your ideas of life is what time scales you're looking at. Because the Earth is very much a living being on a geological time scale. It regenerates itself. Um, so whether it is just biology or if it is geology as well, it, I think goes and you, back and you, to you may know there's a book by Piatica called mm -hmm. Inactive mm -hmm. Cinema. Mm -hmm. It's yes. pretty good on, yes. it, on these questions. Well, I'm glad she dumped you because that made you write all your books and become <laughs> <laughs> so famous. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have it without that. I'll show her. <laughs> <laughs> Even if they're shit, I'll show her. Uh, and, and as we, uh, as both of our final uh, plenary uh, presenters have mentioned uh, metabolism, in, con in these concluding remarks, I'm going to turn it over to my co-director here, uh, Professor Janet Wasco, uh, for uh, concluding remarks to the conference. Janet. Metabolism? <laughs> <laughs> I think the metabolism bit is that we're waiting to be finished so we can go and enjoy the closing reception. That's the metabolism bit. But as is typically, uh, well, has been traditional for a while, we try to forecast and, and give hints for the next what is conference at the end. But I, I'm going to try to be really, really brief because the food and drink is waiting for us. Uh, so we can continue to live and so forth. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And I'm sorry, I really have to thank people. Uh, the sponsors and supporters are listed on page three, four, and five of the program. Erica Voigt, I don't know where she is, but we all, I mean, yeah. she's fundamental. Yeah. Fundamental, absolutely. She's our rock. Uh, John Wolfley and others connected to the, uh, the facility here, Chris Moss and so forth. Doug and David, our tech people, we needed them so much. And Wade Larson, our designer, and Nett Stabebe, who coordinated the graduate assistance. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us to explore the wide array of questions that emerge from the question of what is life. We have learned and confirmed that communication is a part of all living systems. From an interdisciplinary range of approaches, which was emphasized here at the end, biological, cognitive, philosophical, social, cultural, economic, political. We have identified patterns and relationships in systems, networks, ecologies, critiques, ethics, platforms, and even embodied living technologies. We can see how the scale, pace, and pattern can be understood as perhaps environments, perhaps as Professor Martinez suggested, pacha, the earth or cosmos, or perhaps as universes. What is universe? All, it's defined as all of time and space and its contents. But it's not just the universe out there, up there. It is also the biological universe at a microscopic and nanoscopic scale. In addition, it is a space in which something exists, prevails, specific spheres of activity, interest, experience, it's a collection, a population, it's a set of entities, items, quantities. Therefore, we can think about universes, universes of people, of things, universes of media, communications, and discourse. We can think of universes of practices and policies, universes of life. Universe is a concept we often use. We sometimes hang out at universities. 
We talk about universal rights, universal laws, universal suffrage, universal design, and so forth and so forth. Universes of meaning making and praxis. One example, just to give you a very concrete, mundane example, is I recently gave a presentation where I considered Hollywood, the industry of Hollywood, as a universe in various ways with various meanings and so forth. A mundane example. We invite you to think about the multiplicities of universe and explore what is universe in April next year. But first, we welcome you to our final receptions outside the door. Thank you very much. I think we need to thank Janet and Jer. Your metabolism awaits.